Last time we talked about the tripotential resistivity method and um, we worked through a couple of these geometrical factors for the CPPC or the, I guess this is the CPCP array. This is the problem that we left you with. Uh, we worked through the CPPC and the CCPP. Uh, got a minus 6 pi A for this geometrical factor, 2 pi A for this one. Uh, we also noted in a uh, kind of a supplementary uh, discussion that this minus sign here shows up in the uh, dipole-dipole array. Uh, basically, a CCPP is a dipole-dipole uh, configuration. But if you tackled this problem, you found that CPCP uh, um, geometrical factor was 3 pi A. And uh, we kind of highlighted the fact that this tripotential resistivity method was useful for detecting fracture zones and discri discriminating them from other, you know, um, shallower sources, maybe not uh, extensive um, uh, vertical penetrative uh, zones of uh, porosity and permeability. <clears throat> So now we're going to take a look at um, a, we'll take a look at an Excel file here, but uh, this equation comes from Berger, Sheehan, and Jones, and, and uh, they present a nice uh, derivation of this relationship. When we get into the two-layer problem, uh, we've dealt with it um, fairly, you know, simplistically, and with a point in layer one and a point in layer two and so on, but now we're at the surface with with a winter array and we're uh, changing our a spacing uh, out to a certain maximum distance from a certain minimum distance here of one meter uh, so that the total array length would be three meters out to 300 meters so that the total array length would be 900 meters and with this expression here we are able to calculate the apparent uh, resistivity that we'd measure in our survey. And uh, so we can see apparent resistivities as a function of A spacing as we change the A spacing. Uh, <clears throat> we're, we're getting greater depth of penetration. We can see that there's at least two layers here. We, we can see a near surface layer with a resistivity that uh, is about 20. And uh, actually we have the numbers up here. And we can see that we have a deeper layer with a resistivity of 135. So um, what, we're, what we're going to do is just um, take a look at this problem. And um, we're going to just change some of the parameters. So <clears throat> let's change the depth. for Well, let's take a look at the depth here for a minute. The depth of the interface is 16 meters. Uh, and we we have a response here which starts off it shows us the resistivity in the uh, near surface layer and then it rises up to the resistivity in the deeper layer almost so uh, let's we're, we're out at a maximum distance here of 500 meters and we get up to about 127 uh, an apparent resistivity of about 127, as you can see over here. So we really haven't reached the the resistivity of, of the deeper layer. We really haven't, you know, all the current is not flowing in the deeper layer. We have current distributed in the shallower layer and the deeper layer. And so we're seeing an, kind of an approximate value for the deeper layer. And uh, <clears throat> if we change this distance to let's say 150 then you can see we we probably you know trying to guess what the resistivity of the second layer is we would be we would be off so uh, you know as we increase the length of our array from uh, you know an a spacing of 300 meters to an a spacing of 500 meters we're getting here 117 if we go to uh, 500, we're getting up to 127, we're still less than row 2, and that's because current is, is being distributed in, in both layers. The uh, lower resistivity near surface layer, current preferentially wants to flow there, 
and the more resistive, deeper layer. So we have to go out quite a long distance before we can get an accurate um, response revealing what that resistivity, close to what that resistivity might be. The other thing to notice is uh, that the depth to the interface or the thickness of the upper layer, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but it corresponds to the about one half the distance to the inflection point. So an inflection point we see the slopes are increasing here and up to here and then as we go beyond this point they start to decrease. So somewhere between here and here we're going from increasing slopes to decreasing slopes. That point would be called the inflection point. Let's just say that it's 30. So we have 10 on this logarithmic scale we have 10, 20, 30. So let's just say it's 30 so we take half of that that would be our estimate of the depth to the interface. Not, not too bad. You know, it's just, an appro it's just a rough approximation. So we'll, we'll half that. <clears throat> and notice that now we're getting even closer. This interface is much closer to the surface. So uh, we're, we're, you know, at 8 feet beneath the surface. We still have to have an array length of 1,500 meters or an A spacing of 500 meters in order to get a, an apparent resistivity that is close to the actual resistivity of the deeper layer. So probably the kind of work you don't want to go through uh, to lay out a, uh, uh, you know, a, a kilometer and a half, about a mile long, kilometer and a half uh, array. <coughs> but this inflection point then is uh, we're looking at rising slopes here. We start to decrease uh, here. Uh, so, so kind of around here, somewhere around here, we go from a rising slope to a decreasing slope. And let's say that's 18, so 9. Okay, not bad, not bad. Pretty close. So let's go to 4. And here we have, uh, uh, we've just going down by a half, and so we have a rising slope, but eh, we're, we're, are we rising or are we decreasing? It looks like we're kind of, our inflection point's probably right about in here at 12, so we get 6. So this is just a rough uh, seat of the pants kind of an approximation. Row 1, the intersection of the apparent conductivity curve with the smallest A spacing on the Y axis which gives us 20, which is right on the money, and uh, go out as far as you can. Uh, you know, you're going to waste money going out too far trying to run a survey. <clears throat> but trying to realize that this curve is merging, converging asymptotically on this value uh, over here. So, so uh, and then the inflection point, we take one half of that. We get an approximate estimate of the depth. So we can get three pieces of approximate information just from looking at this curve, not doing any modeling at all. And again, we're using this expression here, which comes from uh, Berger, Sheehan, and, uh, and Jones. So this and in other texts, you're going to find um, uh, a discussion of how this equation uh, comes about. And uh, so I'd recommend that you, you know, dig into your textbooks there. And um, so we've just seen a couple, there, there, there are a few points that we can, can make uh, going through that exercise there. The short spacing measurements converge on row 1, so it's easy to estimate row 1. That was 20 ohm meters. The apparent resistivity converges asymptotically on row 2, so we're, you know, we're, we know that we're kind of in the 120, 130 range here. But it takes, you have to get, really, you have to get out to A spacings that are many times the depth to the interface. So it's an economics problem. Uh, how much time, uh, you know, and time-saving effort. How much time can you put into your survey to, you know, if you have a two-layer problem and, and the layer is eight feet deep and you have to go out, uh, uh, you have to set your array up to, to extend out uh, um, 1.5 kilometers. Eh, it may not be worth it. So... Also notice that there are no sharp breaks in the response, that the layer boundary is kind of a gradual transition from the resistivity in one layer to the resistivity in the other. So we don't really see, uh, okay, this is layer one, this is layer two, 
doesn't happen that way. Eh? Be nice if it did, but this is physics. So we get kind of we're we're seeing the influence at the when we're measuring the potential difference. We're seeing the influence on current flow associated with both layers, both the higher resistivity deeper layer and the near surface lower lower resistivity uh, layer. And you know, kind of lastly, of course, there are other points that we can make, but. Lastly, the depth of the interface can be estimated as approximately one half the A spacing around the apparent resistivity inflection point. So we're rising slopes, rising slopes, starting to, well, are we, uh, we're still rising, decreasing. So, you know, we're somewhere in between here and here. The depth would be about 15 meters. We would kind of approximate as one half of this. You know, when it went, in fact, it was 16 meters. So, so these are just, you know, you don't have to sit down and pull out your fancy software. You can get information from the curves that you see. And uh, so that's, that's kind of the takeaway from this. Now, if we look at what the computer does, here's a computer version of the problem. We've got some noise in the data. Uh, we, you know, probably don't want to use this data point in making the calculation, but we can see that the data points kind of, you know, are scattered a little bit about this line here, which is the calculated line based on this model here. So it's kind of a best fit line that minimizes the error in the uh, calculation of apparent resistivities uh, compared to the actual observations. And, um, uh, taking a look at this curve here, uh, doing the same kind of analysis that we talked about doing. We've got, uh, oh, uh, an inflection point at approximately 14 meters, so we'd say the depth would be at about 7 meters. Not bad. We're at about 8 meters. But when we run the equivalent solutions here, notice that we could have depths from about 7 meters to close to 10 meters. So there's some uh, <clears throat> variability in the depth uh, with a certain amount of error. I think there's only about 4% error left in here. And uh, also we can see that there's a possible range of resistivities for that deeper layer. Uh, if we bring the interface up closer to the surface, then that deeper layer has a lower resistivity. If we deepen the interface, then that layer has a higher resistivity, getting up, up almost to 200. So uh, again, two-layer response. Uh, we don't see a sharp break. First layer has a resistivity of about 20 ohmmeters. There are no indications of an asymptote here, but, but you know that it's got to be, it's going to keep on climbing. So it might be up here, you know, so that's what I would usually do, would just say, well, it's going to climb up and converge somewhere up here. That's going to make it, you know, more than 100. So, uh, and the inflection point suggests a depth of around 7 meters. So, on this axis, this is A spacing, and um, <clears throat> again, we, we, we have, um, we're, we're modeling the data. We're trying to minimize the error between the calculations and the observations. Uh, just just because of geology being the way it is, uh, it's not really homogeneous. Uh, you know, when we're out in the field, we know that we have considerable heterogeneity, even over short distances. So equivalent solutions are always recommended. Take a look at the equivalent solutions. Here we're, again, kind of highlighting that we could have depths from about uh, 7 to 10 meters. <clears throat> And that row two could uh, vary between 120 to 190 ohmmeters. 120 being associated with a shallower depth and 190 with a deeper depth. And so our rough interpretation is off. Uh, but, you know, I guess the point to be made here is you just don't throw up your hands and uh, say, well, I can't get anything at all out of this data because there's good information to be had. And uh, definitely take advantage of that and use it uh, to your purpose for putting together your initial starting model. That's kind of the takeaway there. And uh, so the next time we're going to take a look at a modeling exercise, uh, we're not going to go through all of these uh, soundings here. <clears throat> but we're going to be in an area in Missouri. 
and uh, we'll extend our qualitative interpretation approach to multiple layers in the search of gravel aquifers. We'll use these quali qualitative uh, interpretation methods that we've just kind of covered briefly to help us develop our uh, starting model for uh, inversion. So uh, thanks for joining us and talk to you next time.